1996, a former fisherman came to Parliament. Nine years later, the foreshore and seabed legislation would sweep him out of his seat. But Dover Samuels remained a committed member of Labour and a warrior for Te Reo Māori me ona tikanga. In 1868, the first Māori MPs entered New Zealand's House of Representatives. Today, there have never been more Māori in Parliament. They span the political and cultural spectrum and continue to leave an indelible mark on our political landscape. In this series, we'll explore the legacies of former Māori MPs as they speak about their time in politics. I'm Mihingarangi Forbes, presenter and journalist. This is Mātangi Reya. Utia teri to ta harakeke, vakatai rangi tia releki uta, releki tai. Ka ki mai koe ke hau e hata me nui o te ne ao. Ma ku ki a tu ka koe he tangata, he tangata, he tangata he. Te he mauriara, e te takoto mai, taku waka, tupuna, te maa tātua, ki roto o tākau, takoto mai. Takoto mai, takoto mai. You grew up in, as you put it, with your feet in the waters of Matauri Bay. What does it mean to be Ngāti Kura? Well, first of all, can I say that uh, <clears throat> I'm looking around the walls of this uh, Whareha's room and I see the leaders, the political leaders of the past brings a spiritual dimension to myself because I knew a number of them personally. Mm. And I see my rangatira up there, Machurata, from Ngati Kuri. His background was very similar to mine. And growing up uh, in a very isolated uh, Māori community beside the sea, it was part of our being. Every rock, every island, every beach was part of who we were. And of course, the history and the whakapapa that went with it uh, was taught to us all as little tamariki uh, around the Barai by the Kaumatua and the Kukuyas of those days. And even though we were poor, when we talk about poverty, there's no money. But we were rich in other things, in other aspects of life. And we uh, lived in a very simple life, but we were happy. And yet there were no supermarkets, there were no shops, but we, we ate well. Our parents ensured that uh, we didn't go to school hungry. Uh, we had very simple clothes, bare feet, of course, and then in my, younger, in my younger days, this is just after the uh, Second World War was announced, I was about five, six years old when I began going to school. Of course, we all rode our horses to school through the bush, there was no road. And our school was called Whakarawa Native School. Whakarawa Te Maunga, and the school was uh, built underneath it. And I remember distinctly, and I'll never forget the times that <clears throat> uh, I was told when we got off our horse, at the gate. Uh, translated, leave your horse outside the gate, leave your language outside the gate, leave your culture outside the gate, because you're entering a different world. 
and uh, that was my beginning of an attempt by the Crown to disempower me. When you are susceptible <clears throat> at a very young age to that kind of influence, then it stays with you forever. And the caning of uh, my generation simply for speaking our language uh, was something that today's generation uh, would never tolerate, absolutely. When you say um, that it never leaves you, you know, the, that punishment by the Crown for speaking your, your own language, how does it manifest in your life? Can you remember moments where, you know, that lived with you? Well, I always remember, and the sad thing about it is my generation is passing away. <clears throat> and uh, a matter of record, uh, there was a claim that was initiated by myself many years ago in the 1980s. Uh, supported by many Kaumatua who are not here anymore. The last one, I think, who really got up and, and gave the Crown a bit of a hurry up about it was King Itoto, who himself has passed away. And a very prominent Kaumatua in Ngāpuhi in the language. Uh, the Crown has to actually turn the rock over and have a look at what happened to that generation before it's too late. And I've asked uh, uh, our member, Calvin Davis, who is the Minister of Te Arawhiti, as well as the personal letter to the Prime Minister, uh, but we're still waiting. I've heard you give evidence at Te Paparahi o Te Raki um, inquiries about the real. Mm. And, you know, you're not a young person anymore, but it's still... Don't say that. It still <laughs> brings so much emotion. <laughs> you know, the whole room's crying when you give evidence, yeah. you know. Why do you think that is? What, what is so important about your real? Well, I, I think that uh, very clearly that it was a deliberate policy of the Crown. It wasn't just the language. Mm. I mean, it was the effect of that generation. Uh, and it went on and on and on. And then, of course, the Raupatu opened up of the land and, and all the injustices uh, that generation was aware of manifested deeply in many, many Māori communities. And I thought it already happened at Whakarara Native School. But as the sun rose, you could see that, in fact, that was a deliberate policy by the Crown through the Ministry of Education at that time uh, to disempower a nation and they started off with their children. So what do you remember of the hikoi ki te whariparimata, Fina Cooper's walk? What do you remember about that? You were part of a council. Yes, I, I, I remember that. Mm. I remember that. And I think that was a great occasion. It was true, it was symbolic. And you know, it took a matriarch uh, from Pangaru to be able to galvanise the people. It took a long time uh, for the act to be amended. Uh, so that, in fact, they couldn't, they didn't have the power to actually take uh, Whenua Māori. But at that time it did. And that's what really uh, initiated uh, my vision uh, and my determination uh, was the challenges of being able to, to hold on to our Whenua and to be able to develop a Whenua in a way that we wanted. But as someone who grew up in the north, um, I imagine as a politician you went to Waitangi every single year. Did you do the same as a child, as a young person? What did Waitangi Day mean back then? Well, <clears throat> I wasn't a radical, put it that way. Uh, I wasn't a radical like Horney and Shane Jones. And, you know, <clears throat> I was a more of a, a sort of a moderate. And you're right, I, I just can't count uh, the Waitangi Days that I've attended, and I still attend them. I missed maybe one or two. Uh, but I've seen the change, and <clears throat> unfortunately, Waitangi has been used for political expression by all sectors. The media has got a lot to contribute to that, you know? They were all looking for controversy in the past, but I was there when Norman Kirk was... I was there when the leaders of different nations were welcomed onto those marais, and we were proud of Singapore. Uh, because there was no, you had differences, but you respected your manuhiri. That was the tikanga, and I'd say that that was the kawa of Māoridom right throughout, hakuaka way. Didn't make any difference what iwi you belonged to. And that was very profound. And of course, that was uh, the image of Waitangi in those days. And good God, how it's changed. How's it changed? Well, I didn't support Hine Whare throwing a bloody wet towel at the Queen, or whatever. Uh, and I didn't support uh, 
I mean, it demeans, uh, you, you, you think about it, and some of the instances where Dawn Brasco throwing mud at and some sort of dildo condom or something thrown at people. You know, <clears throat> the spirit of Waitangi and Waitangi Day is bigger than that, and it deserves respect. You can have differences in opinion, absolutely. Uh, but very clearly, the tone uh, that has uh, evolved uh, from the top marae uh, has been one of accommodation and respect to our Prime Minister and to the Prime Ministers who have been uh, invited up there uh, since it was moved from the Titi marae up to the top, to the, to the Whare Wanai. After serving in the Air Force, Samuels moved to Australia to perform with the Māori show bands. He returned to Matodi Bay in the late 80s, entering the fishing and tourism industries. But in 1996, Parliament called. Samuel stood in Te Tai Tokero, and while he didn't win the seat, he was elected on the Labour list. What was it like for you? You were 57 when you stepped into this place. Was it overwhelming? Well, <clears throat> I'm listening to Rawiri the other day with his portai on talking about no wonder uh, he can understand how Pākehā feels when they step into the marae. Yeah. Well, I think the Pākehā was scared uh, to step into the marae because he might have thought that he was going to be put into a hangi. Well, that didn't happen to me here. It didn't happen to me here because I was a senior vice president of the Labour Party uh, for some years. We were told, when you came into the house, keep your mouth shut, open your taringas, open your ears. Uh, do that for three years and you, you do your apprentice and hopefully after the next three years you'll be able to put practical policies into place to help your people. So that was my <coughs> indoctrination as, as uh, a member of parliament in the opposition at that time. But I go back to the early times whereby we certainly uh, had some big movers and shakers in the Labour Party. I mean, we were involved in changing circumstances. We had people like Pat Kelly, we had, we had you know, the trade union, and then all of a sudden we had the Messiah, we had Winston rise, with him took all the Maori seats, and we were pretty poor. We were very thin on the ground. Mm. In fact, the Maori Policy Council, we couldn't even get a bloody quorum. We couldn't get a quorum to have our meetings at the conference. So uh, this is how it was at the time. The landscape was very barren and there was very little support, but we carried on. And slowly but surely, we began to gain the support and the confidence, not just of Māori, of our people, and of course the Labour Party had always had a very close relationship uh, with, uh, with Ratana, beginning of the four, you know, four wins when we originally had the, the four Māori members of parliament and that's where it all started, but then Labour started to gain traction in terms of the wider, uh, wider public support from the electorate. Uh, but it culminated in a lot of warfare between different personalities. Mm. What was your relationship with, uh, with Helen Clark like? Very professional, iron lady. Um, uh, she was a professional politician. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, she was unique, but uh, she certainly polarised people, well, not only uh, people within uh, the government, uh, but people outside. She was very avid uh, in, in her vision for where Labour should go, and if you didn't concur with that, well, you were on the sideline. What were her weaknesses? Uh, looking back, uh, there was an influence, a mixture of different kinds of people. And I guess I was a little bit old-fashioned, brought up in a very Māori uh, community, kanuhi get the kanuhi. You shook hands with somebody and that was your word. Uh, your word was your bond. There wasn't any sort of gobbledygook, uh, uh, hidden language uh, messages given. It was just, that's it, that's who you are, that's who I am. I imagine she leaned on you for cultural guidance, um, you know, when you're at Waitangi and places like that. Do you recall the moment in that whare when she was uh, reduced to tears? Well, I think that, unfortunately, she sort of blamed me for that, in that I gave her the word that I got the commitment I got 
from the Taumata Kaumatua, uh, or that Marae, uh, which I had called a meeting with on a number of occasions, knowing that Titifai would be there and, and uh, you know, and being the matriarch of Ngāpuhi, um, <clears throat> if things didn't go her way, uh, she'd uh, get up and do the haka. Now, uh, they had, even King Toto was there. And uh, even though that they gave me their commitment, collectively, as soon as Titifai got up, they all surrendered. But they ran like hell, and all of a sudden, we've got the Prime Minister uh, being challenged by uh, by Titifai in terms of the kawa of the marae, and yet uh, the Ngāpui elders and the kaumata have given, had given me their uh, assurance that in fact Helen would be able to speak in that part of the, the ceremony. And I made it very clear uh, that was unusual, and they said to me that that privilege would be given to her and her alone. And of course, when it all erupted, and I, I, I don't blame, I don't blame the Prime Minister, I don't blame Helen for making bursting into tears you know, with that kind of performance uh, from Titifai and the non-interference uh, by those kaumata who say that they, they have the authority to be able to sit the kawa for the marae. But looking back, perhaps I should never have taken their confidence and extended that opportunity to, to Helen at that time. A year after the Waitangi incident, Labour won the 1999 general election with Samuel's unseating Tauhinare in Te Taitokerau. You became the 39th uh, Minister for Māori Affairs. What was that like? Was that your, one of your proudest well, moments? <clears throat> when I got my commission from the Governor General, I thought Helen Clark was going to give me a kiss. That didn't happen. Didn't happen. But it, it was the greatest challenge in my life. What did you set out? What was your plan? Well, one of the first things that I wanted to do was to reintroduce the trade training. Because uh, uh, I remember the Maori trade training program and many of our young people were, got, were trained as carpenters. And at that time, uh, there were very, very few initiatives in terms of uh, trade training. So I went and talked to a lot of our vets from the Maori Battalion. Uh, because I was, and of course my background, I've been in the Air Force for a number of years, I had, I've had a military background, so services background, and uh, I talked to a number of our vets about them supporting a Maori Battalion a trade training program. And I put a paper together, and at that time, anything to do with military was warmongering. There was that... <clears throat> Uh, that feeling amongst the caucus at that time, uh, and I guess you, know, you don't you, you don't have to be a, a, you know, a clairvoyant to understand and to even identify those people who would be totally opposed to that in my caucus at that time. Even though I said I've talked to the vets, this has got nothing to do with a call to arms, but what is to do uh, with giving our younger people from 17 to 19 to 20 an opportunity to be in an environment whereby not only would it offer them uh, a trade for the future, but an environment of comradeship and discipline. A number of my friends understood that and, and, and actually supported it, but uh, it didn't fly, uh, simply because it didn't have the social welfare or the work and income logo to it. This was the Murray Battalion uh, trade training program. So I was disappointed in that. A couple of other uh, issues that I took on board was the establishment of the Maori Business Facilitation Service. And at that time, because I was always interested in uh, uh, Maori opportunities for economic development, and of course, subsequent to that, I got the post uh, for supporting Jim Anderton as regional economic uh, minister. Um, uh, but what I wanted to do uh, was to give our people, especially those who are out in the regions, an opportunity to establish their small businesses. Uh, Realising, and, 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 and certainly the evidence was there, uh, that the New Zealand economy benefited from SMEs, small enterprises, and Māori was, you know, was ready to move into that, but they had problem getting finance. Mm -hmm. 
The other aspect of the policy uh, that I initiated was Papakaina housing. And uh, an example of that is Taco Bay now, where you've got Ngāti here, where they've got Papakaina because of the difficulties that we had of getting finance. And uh, the radu dadu in regard to the utilisation of multiple oil Māori land. And sometimes it's our own fault, uh, even though uh, there is uh, funds available for the establishment. And I'm, uh, and, and I'm uh, confident that that will still roll out, especially now in these times of housing shortages and un unaffordability of houses for our people, especially in the regions. So you could see a housing issue way well, absolutely. back then? Absolutely. I took the select committee and we travelled to Taitokoro, starting <coughs> with the Uriaho, I'd cope right up to the far north and had a look at the shambles and the shanties and they're still there now. They're still there now. It's the same thing. It's still there now. There are two aspects of it. To me, uh, the release of land for Māori housing through the Māori Land Court and the status of Māori land, it's got to change. It's got to be made easier. You talk about changes to the RMA, there's got to be changes to the Tūra Whenua Act also. Get rid of the bureaucracy. And for those people, if they've got enough uh, tikka shares of land, let them build their house there and get on with it. And the other one, of course, is the establishment of Māori television. And I've got to take my hat off to the Minister of Ngāti Hina, Tauhenare. He was the one who actually initiated that. I picked it up with Helen Clark and then handed it on to Parikura. Because, oh, the Māori TV, here we go again. Just like Māori constituency electorates we want to fund these Māoris because they want to be on television. What's wrong with Te Karere? That's enough. Te Karere. That's, that's, that's good enough. You want to own a television to be paid by the taxpayer. Come on. So there was arguments, interesting conversations for, for that alone. Uh, but I got to hand it to Tau. Uh, he was the architect of it, and we carried it on. The, the sad thing about it is that I only got to implement fewer of what I saw were visionary policies. Uh, because Parikura took over after me, and, uh, after that. Just a year into his tenure, Samuels was forced to resign his ministerial posts when he became the subject of a police investigation into alleged historical sex crimes. Police found there was insufficient evidence, but Samuels never regained his Māori affairs portfolio. And the architect that initiated that, we all know, was Richard Pribble. Sometimes <clears throat> I regret, and I'm not smacking him between the eyes when we were in the, in the you know, not giving him a, an uppercut, if you like. Uh, John Tamahere and Parakura said to me, oh, you should thank us for pulling you back. But there it is. I was a vulnerable target without any justification. I mean, he'd heard it from somebody else and somebody else had told him something. So then he raises it in the house and he raises it with the PM. In terms of your party, your leadership, you know, how did those discussions go? Because as you say, many ministers have, have had allegations thrown at them and their leadership stands behind them. Did your leadership stand behind you? Well, number one, I think Richard uh, didn't realise he was uh, dealing with a Ngāpuhi warrior at that time. I had all the, all the bloody uh, undercover agents knocking on my door in the beehive. Oh, Dover, yeah. for your own sake, you should resign. Hold on your sword. I realised I had a few mates around. Sandra Lee walked into my door and said, Kikaha matua. Tamarhe walked to my door and said, Tell them to bugger off. And uh, so I got this, uh, the messages from up the uh, top of the top of the tree coming down, say, Oh, Dover, you know, this is not good for you. These are guys that didn't like me anyway. They got the bloody audacity to come in and tell me I had to step aside. And, uh, so I refused. Simple as that, but so I got sacked. Did she talk to you first? I don't know, I just got noticed that I'm, I've, been, I've been, been notified of the Governor General. It was an interesting part of my political life. It was interesting because you begin to see through the veil of hypocrisy. And I was always told, I was, I was told by a number of political friends when you're out of politics, you realise you have very few friends in politics because when you're there, the underlying ethos of it is I want something from you and you're going to have to pay it back. So that's the level of friendship 
And that kind of unspoken covenant, if you like, mm. is closed off to the inner circle, to the inner circle. Uh, so you have uh, uh, different personalities with different egos that complement each other. And of course, very few of them at that time were Māori. So after you were sacked as the Minister for Māori Affairs, what were the next couple of years like for you in that place? Well, I was moved, I was, yes, you, I was relieved lost. off that commission, of yes. that portfolio. But of course, as soon as uh, the police said there was no grounds for any charges, uh, then uh, the atmosphere changed again. Were you welcomed back the, into Well, the... there was a reconciliation, but I had a meeting uh, with the Prime Minister, Helen Clark, uh, to see if we can uh, come to some arrangement. Mm. The mother of my children at that time, a recent cadence mum, wanted an apology. Nothing else would have sufficed. So there was a statement that came out, and it's a matter of record. Uh, I decided to, you know, you can carry the hurt, just, just maybe just like the quarter of Māori, mm. you know, Māori language. Mm. You can carry it and stay there with a the chip on your shoulder all the time. So, but what are you there for? You know, mm. Abandoning ship now and saying, oh, buggy, I'm, I've had enough of this, uh, this all this hypocrisy. This, that would have been the easy way. Uh, but uh, there was still a lot to be done. But if Samuels thought his hardest days in politics were behind him, he was wrong. Labour's handling of Māori claims to the foreshore and seabed was set to divide Aotearoa. 2004 came about the seabed and foreshore issue mm. really came to, to a head. The right of iwi to challenge mm. uh, the Crown and court was removed. I mean, what were you hearing from home? What was your position? Number one is it was an extremely hard decision to make. There were forces coming at you from all quarters and internally. Uh, we certainly burnt the midnight oil and I think that Cullen uh, fell half asleep through going, who do you to my talking about uh, what are the alternatives, the whole issue, how it can be reconciled, and not necessarily in favour of Māori, but don't get Māori offside, but uh, you have to give consideration uh, to the political impact uh, on the nation. And sometimes you can paralyse something by analysis, but Cullen steered it through, but there was still unease, and I'm going to say that uh, whilst Tariana walked away from it, uh, I think if we had all walked away from it, it would have gone ahead without any consideration at all for Māori rights and interests of the seabed. The word was compromise, and perhaps that's what we're faced with now in terms of tinoranga tiratanga of Māori to wai Māori, to water. Mm. It could be the same scenario. And so what's your message to Māori MPs inside well, this house well, well, on, I'm, on I'm, water, I, I, given what I, you know I, about I understand. I understand the complexity. But if you have a look really at the minimum changes that have sort of diluted uh, Māori's uh, anger, if you like, there's very little changes to the foreshore seabed from its original. But people don't understand that. I think it was a political smokescreen at the end of the day, because anybody who knows uh, the act and compares it with the tinkering changes that seem to have satisfied this uh, revolution, I think they need to have a look at it very, very carefully and see if they are what they expected would happen, because funny thing, it's sort of died out, isn't it? Looking back on it, though, the, the act, was it wrong? It was a political decision. I mean, there was some challenges in, in regard to the statutes, to the law, and there was challenges to the Act. And at that time, uh, the Cabinet decided that there had to be some clarity given uh, because there were challenges emerging from the courts, not unlike Boy Māori now, there were challenges. And uh, there was that political commitment on behalf of the Labour government at that time to resolve it. Uh, through the political process, hence the genesis of the Māori Party. Uh, and we all know that as a matter of record, but we, we copped a lot of flack through it, and, uh, and I understand that, and I understand that. 
When did you hear that there was this hikoi starting coming down the country to Parliament? Well, I think that was on the news that there was a hikoi. It was well publicised. I mean, the hikoi itself. When it arrived, though, were you surprised by the size? No, of I wasn't it? surprised. I wasn't surprised. We were all down there. We went down in, in front of the hikoi. I mean, we you know, we copped it. We were the sellouts. Tadi and I was the matriarch. Simple as that. That's that's how it was painted. That's how it's yeah. painted. How was it for you, coming out to the forecourt? Absolutely. With your whānau yeah. arriving with yeah. buckets of sand and yeah. buckets of seawater and yeah. a whole lot of other stuff. Mm. You know, just on a spiritual level, mm. what was that like well, for you? Well, it, it, was, it was pretty hurtful because the opposition to that was certainly made very clear from what they could have made up with. But then again, it's easy to hang on and to expound your feelings when, in fact, uh, you don't have to make a decision uh, for the whole country. And that's the point. And the point is, if there was a decision that, was, that would be made in the Cabinet, it wasn't just my view of things. It wasn't just through a Māori lens, because that decision could very well impact upon the wider community that can't, doesn't see things through the Māori lens and would be totally opposed, and it would have its political ramifications. I mean, that was the, that's the horror, and it's still you know, happening now. But hallelujah, we've got a different situation now, and there's no excuse, is there? Because I've got a mandate. You stood um, out there for hours and hours, you know, side by side with your Labour Māori MPs. You know, what kind of abuse did you experience? Was there anything that stuck out? Well, I, I think that uh, as the realisation uh, of there wasn't major changes in the purpose of the bill, right? Um, it's it's virtually the same. But it was more about, you know, a government that was able to just change the law overnight mm. um, against the right of Māori to go to yeah. court. It was more symbolic than, you know, what the legislation meant. And for, for, for those Māori that marched that day, it was about being told what to do again, wasn't it? Well, yes, you're right. You're correct. But right now we're going through the, what they call a MACA process. There are different legal avenues whereby uh, you can seek remedies from the courts. But I would have been more comfortable if that had been resolved politically, uh, recognising and, 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 and giving, in essence, recognising Māori ticking on uh, to the foreshore seabed. But uh, that is a challenge, and uh, don't forget when we are looking at that as a natural resource, as a Tonga, there's going to be similar challenges that are going to emerge under the same principles. Uh, let's hope uh, that the uh, Māori representation of this era recognises the mistakes of the past. We'll see. Was there a moment there, Dover, that you considered crossing the floor with Tariana? No, I... I uh, uh, my pedigree with Labour goes back to probably too deep. By the 2005 election, Māori voters were ready to hold Labour to account for its foreshore and seabed legislation. And it was Labour's Māori MPs who felt the full force of their wrath. Labour lost four of the seven Māori seats, including Te Tai Tokerau. In 2005, did you know you were going to lose? I, I, I thought that uh, I, 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 mean, I would be at risk mm. in 2005. You know, how did you feel that election night when that played out like that? I was disappointed, but being in politics for a while, I have to accept that uh, that's the reality of, of politics. There was those highlight times when you had the support. And I always say uh, to politicians that riding the high wave now, even this new generation, the time will come. You're sitting on the moonga, on the crest of the wave this time, but waves through their nature. There's another side that goes down the other side. What did you make of the Māori Party when they first got... Well, you can't, well there's no comparison. There's, there's, you, you can't compare because the New Zealand social, economic image, if you like, politically, right, has always been blue and red. Then you've got the fringes. Tell me when is the fringes or any party on the fringe, either the left or the right, really have achieved anything 
momentous. No, tell me. You've got Donald Duck here now with him with, with the Act Party. Now he's going around and the men you've got the Dancing with the Stars. Oh, lovely stuff. You've got all these new people that come in. Hooray, you know, here we are, members of parliament. Well, what are they going to deliver? This is the reality of it. If you're not around the table, if, you're not, if you don't hold a range of power, you deliver nothing. Winston recognised that years ago, right? And he's the only Houdini who's got a, 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 a minor party that really pulls the levers. That's why he gets up the, you know, the nose of many people who historically and politically have been in charge of the levers. So here comes this kingmaker from Ngatiwai, and he says, if you want to sit on that throne there, you're going to have to let me pull the levers. OK. If you could name one single achievement in politics, what would it be? Personally, I would say that saving the hospital in Taitawera. And I have to thank Annette King for assisting me in doing that. There was a threat that the Kaitaia Hospital would be closed and a number of our hospitals would be closed. And uh, the, the central for Taitokoro, for Northland, would be the DHB in Whangarei. And all these others would be just satellite clinics. Well, if you go up to the Kaitaia Hospital now, it was money well spent. A flagship, if you like, for our far north regional hospital. Now we have Kawakawa also. See, these, these type of services are very close to the, to the heart of people in our communities, especially when we are in the regions. But I, I just want to say that in the last few years, the coalition government has actually uplifted the economic spirit of our region. There is a feeling of optimism that's never been there before. The Taitokoro uh, is my birthplace. And Taitokoro had been taken for granted by various governments. The roads, and the jobs, the housing. You've heard it, you hear it all the time. But it was a political uh, reason. And the reason was uh, it, it took Northland Taitokoro for granted all the time. Because it was there, the hippies, you know, they were like sheep, sheep. I mean, it was blue ribbon territory for years and years and years and years. And this is the first time, and I guess in my lifetime, that I've seen real progress and real, real investment in our region. And, and Māori has to take the initiative and be a part of it. Looking at this current government, you know, who do you most admire? Who do I admire? Well, I've got to admire the Prime Minister. And what I've advocated is that the wind has been behind them. The natural phenomenon that has bestowed the election and the timing, it uh, couldn't be more divine. Think about it. Even though there was sadness and tragedy, that whole combination has culminated into the trade winds of victory. Now, the challenge, of course, is to steer the waka, and sometimes when the trade winds blow so strong in your favour that it becomes too fast, it becomes too powerful for you to control. And the likelihood of going off course is very real. And if you've got a new group of crew that really haven't had the opportunity of handling this waka under uh, those kind of prevailing conditions, and, and this is why I think the Prime Minister was very fortunate in the early days of coalition. You had the navigator there that knew how to steer by the stars, and that was Winston. There's the Komato there. So I'm looking to, to find out, to identify, well, who can be uh, beside the Prime Minister? Who's the navigator? That's right. This is unprecedented. First past the post Waka government, it's got a huge mandate unprecedented mandate, they have to deliver. And of course, we have the die-in-the-wood politicians that believe the only medicine is an economic revival. Well, that's only one of the challenges. There are a number of others. They've got to line the political stars up so that, in fact, the nation can move forward. Now, Whilst the influence of that 
natural evolution changes have resulted in a, in a uh, landslide, uh, huge mandate, the reverse can begin to happen. And the reverse effects can actually be absolutely devastating if they don't utilise that mandate in a way that can get New Zealand, our, our Fenua, to the place where we all wanted to be. Mm. Otherwise, you've got these crises banging on all sides. It's not because you haven't got the mandate, because you haven't got the horsepower, the political will, commitment to actually get on and finish the job. How would you like to, this is Pātai Whakamutunga, how would you like to be remembered? Well, this is what somebody said to me the other day. Uh, they said, Dover, uh, somebody said that you're a life member of the Labour Party. Well, yeah. And I said, while I'm still alive, absolutely. That's how I want to be remembered. Kā nui te mihi, kia irirangi te motu.